Good morning, good afternoon or good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Corbridge and I'm honoured to be the Vice Chancellor and Warden of Durham University and it's my very great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you to Knowledge Across Borders, a new webinar series brought to you by Durham University in partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us. We'll shortly be hearing from our two very distinguished academics, Professor Nancy Cartwright, who is a fellow both of the British Academy and of the Academy of Social Sciences, and Professor Tom McLeish, who's a fellow of the Royal Society. Their question and answer session will be chaired by my colleague, Professor Junji Wu. Junji is a Deputy Executive Dean in the Faculty of Science here at Durham University. This is the second edition of our Knowledge Across Borders series, and it's a key part of Durham's long-standing friendship and partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Our academics are delighted to work together with colleagues from the Academy on matters of global concern, in the process publishing many papers together. And it's very pleasing to be able to say that today, Professor Dennis Noble from Oxford University, who's also a fellow of the Royal Society and a co-founder of Voices from Oxford, is promoting our Knowledge Across Borders webinar. So thank you, Professor Noble. Today's lecture will focus on the challenges and opportunities of working across different disciplines in research. Durham University has a strong commitment to applied interdisciplinary research and one of our teams that has been in the news lately has been our Hearing the Voice research group. This research team includes academics from cognitive neuroscience, anthropology, English studies, medical humanities, philosophy, psychiatry, psychology and theology. And these colleagues in turn are working alongside medical clinicians, arts and health practitioners, and voice hearers themselves. Drawing on all these diverse perspectives, the project is exploring voice hearing in entirely new ways. In recognition of their outstanding research at the interface of the arts and humanities and medicine, the Hearing the Voice team has just recently been awarded this year's Medical Humanities Award for Best Research by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the Wellcome Trust. So I hope that today's webinar will also stimulate new ideas, partnerships and ways of thinking. Before introducing our first speaker though, let me pause for a moment and say how delighted I am that Consul General Jung, the Consul General of the People's Republic of China in Manchester and an old friend of Durham is able to join us today and say a few words. So it's my great pleasure now to hand over to our friend, the Consul General. Dear Vice Chancellor, Professor Stuart Koblich, dear Vice, dear Pro Vice Chancellor Kyle O'Malley, and dear Professor Lancy Cartwright, Professor Tom McLeish, Professor Jun Jie Wu, uh, distinguished guests, very good morning. It's great honor for me to join the second webinar in the Knowledge Across Borders series. We are coming to the end of an extraordinary and a difficult year. As the Premier Boris Johnson's open remarks at the Climate Ambition Summit, vacancy that have been products each and every one of them of vast international efforts in laboratories around the world. And it's also the best proof of the value of knowledge across borders we are discussing today. As we all know, Durham University and the Chinese Academy of Science are top research institutions in UK and China. During last year's visit, I had the honor to witness the scientific research strengthening of Durham University in person. Next year, China and Britain will hold the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming and the UN Climate Change the Conference in Glasgow, respectively. The leaders of our two countries have reached the important consensus on strengthening coordination and cooperation between the two sides. 
I strongly believe that the knowledge across borders series could have very good contributions in the above fields. I sincerely wish today's event completely success. Thank you. Let me hand it back to Vice Chancellor, my dear friend, Coverage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Consul General Chung, for those very kind remarks, for being with us this morning, and for your support of the Knowledge Across Borders initiative. It's, it's lovely to see you. And now to today's talks by Professors McLeish and Cartwright. Very shortly, we will hear from Tom McLeish, who's based at the University of York in the UK, where he's a professor of natural philosophy in the Department of Physics, with positions also in the Centre for Medieval Studies and the Humanities Research Centre. Professor McLeish is a fellow of the Royal Society, as I said before, and currently sits on its council. Tom has won numerous national and international awards for his interdisciplinary research in soft matter and biological physics. But he also works across the sciences and humanities on topics in medieval science, theology, sociology, and the philosophy of science. Just before I hand over to Tom though, who in turn will introduce Nancy Cartwright, we're going to play a short video that we've prepared at Durham to celebrate our partnership with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. As dedicated pioneers of groundbreaking research, Durham University and the Chinese Academy of Sciences are working together to push the limits of scientific exploration. We are committed to international collaboration, creating scientific solutions to understand our world and beyond. The Chinese Academy of Sciences, China's driving force in exploring natural sciences and harnessing technology. Durham University, a globally outstanding centre of teaching and research, inspiring our people to make a world-changing difference. We share common ground. Both centres of world-changing research and innovative teaching. Both with a commitment to interdisciplinary research, producing practical solutions to real-world problems. Energy to astronomy. Surface science to climate change. Together, we are stronger and will achieve so much more. We will stimulate fresh ideas, open up new perspectives across intellectual and geographical boundaries, and create a better understanding of the big scientific questions. We will inspire you to explore how science can improve the world and change our lives. We invite you to join us. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Stuart, very much for that very kind invitation and to Consul General Jung, too, for those very wise words. Um, maybe uh, I should explain one thing that uh, Stuart didn't, didn't, uh, didn't uh, mention is why uh, an academic from a few miles to the south is invited to join um, uh, a, 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 a wonderful seminar like this. It's because I spent 10 years at Durham, and in fact, while I was there, uh, for some of those years did the job as vice president, as you'd say, of research or pro vice chancellor for research. And I just mentioned that because I remember when that award-winning Hearing the Voice project was a few people in a room bravely trying to meet each other from psychology and history and theology and medieval studies, wondering what on earth it, they could do together from their different disciplines about this wonderful interdisciplinary subject of people who hear, hear voices. So it is, a, I didn't realize they'd won the award. It's a very thrilling moment to hear that, Stuart. So uh, welcome everyone to this exciting challenge. It reminds me um, that something that astronauts say uh, from Earth orbit uh, is that uh, one cannot see the boundaries or frontiers between countries from space. 
Um, and of course, the reason one cannot see the boundaries is because they're artificial, they're human. We construct them. The earth and its geology and geography doesn't know about boundaries. It seems to me uh, that that's a helpful metaphor for us as we look down on the other world, the global world of knowledge. But we also construct artificial boundaries, we call them disciplinary boundaries, um, but to understand the world of knowledge, just as it is important to understand our, our global planet, we need to know how to cross those frontiers. Now, of course, uh, when we're on the ground, it is no easier to cross frontiers between disciplines than it is the frontiers that we construct between our countries. But do it, we must, because as both our countries have learnt and are learning together and with other partners, we can do so much more together than we can on our own. And the world of knowledge doesn't recognize our disciplinary boundaries. It's delightful to see um, both, both of our countries engaged in supporting this boundary, boundary crossing and frontier crossing uh, activity. Uh, I know that the Chinese Ministry of Education, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, has launched schemes by which the sciences, the social sciences, the arts and humanities can work together. Similarly in the UK, uh, the work that I've done in the Royal Society and also with our partners with UK Research and Innovation are constructing new schemes actually to enable academics to work together across frontiers that they've rarely, if at all, crossed before. So um, it, it gives me huge pleasure to be here and it gives me huge pleasure to introduce um, someone I can't imagine anyone better to uh, begin uh, assisting us, navigating us across frontiers of knowledge in this interdisciplinary world, um, who embodies not only the intellectual values needed to do that, uh, but the personal values of patience, of, of listening, of a little bit of courage in, in, uh, in um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, venturing into new, new territory, a lifelong desire to learn. Those are just some of the attributes we need. Nancy Cartwright is one of the leading philosophers of science in our time, uh, beginning her career as a scientist, a BSc in, in mathematics, actually at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, she took a PhD at the University of Illinois in Chicago on uh, quantum mechanical mixed states. We need to talk about that later, Nancy, I think. Um, she's taught at the universities of, of Maryland, uh, Stanford, uh, the London School of e Economics, uh, 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 LSE, um, and she currently holds joint positions at the University of Durham and the University of California at San Diego. Uh, she has uh, many, many books uh, and awards to her credit. I remember as relatively young scientist being uh, but interested in finding my way around framing of science, how I should think about science, reading her beautiful Cambridge University Press book, The Dappled World. Um, just to explain that, um, think, of, um, think of high summer uh, and a, a broadleaf tree and the sunlight filtering down and making patches of light underneath the, the, the tree on the grass beneath. Actually, for those of us caught in a northern winter right now, let's hold that picture for a few minutes. It might help. <laughs> but that, that uh, dappled, um, connected, overlapping spheres of, of light on the ground is Nancy's metaphor for how physics bakes patches uh, of, of, the, of understanding of the world. I have to say it's always been, the, uh, as soon as I read it, I thought, yes, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. And I think uh, being what it's identifying what doing science and research is like has characterized Nancy's work uh, throughout. She has been both president and vice president of the uh, um, uh, Philosophy of Science Association. And in, in the UK, she's a fellow of the British Academy, which is our National Academy for Arts and the uh, and the social sciences. Uh, she spent, as she says, the first two uh, decades of her life um, uh, working on the philosophy of physics and two more decades there, um, well, it's her, her giveaway, not, not mine, on the philosophy of social and economic sciences um, and now is working on the philosophy of social technology. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, I can imagine no one as a better guide crossing multiple frontiers of interdisciplinary knowledge. Nancy, over to you, and we're looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say. 
Thank you very much, Tom. Um, it's an honor to be with you. All right. Um, I want today to talk about a problem that um, I think is not quite the problem that it's often said to be, which is the siloization of science. Um, this has been heavily um, criticized sciences for being siloized uh, recently in the uh, social sciences, but it's also a standing ob um, objection uh, to problems in the, um, in the uh, natural sciences as well. Sorry, I'm just adjusting my screen. Okay. Um, now, I have a happier story to tell. I think this is not such a problem as everyone, as you know, the critics say, um, because I think that um, siloization is impossible in science. Uh, if you're not doing interdisciplinarity, you're not doing science. Um, now, I want to talk about two aspects to this. The first is dependence on other disciplines or reliance on them. And I think that's necessary to do science. You can't be doing science um, unless you're doing interdisciplinarity. But the second thing is there's a, a, a different aspect, which is not dependence on other disciplines, but rather cooperation with them or working together. And that's necessary if you want to do anything with science. Now, the problem <laughs> really is with the, sec with the second. That's the hard one. Okay. I'm going to begin with doing science. Um, and the first part, this discussion of doing science, is where the philosophy comes in, primarily the heavy philosophy. Um, relying on a multitude of other disciplines is just unavoidable. Uh, we know about borrowing. I mean, you have to borrow measures, concepts, devices, theories, techniques. You just couldn't get forward um, if you had to rely on your own discipline um, for, uh, or your own sub-discipline uh, for uh, how to measure things. Uh, you couldn't borrow any concepts and so forth. So it's clear to all of you that when you're doing science, you're borrowing. Um, what I want to do is explain a deeper reason. It's not just that you, know, you couldn't do all this yourself, but a deeper reason why you have to borrow. Um, and that's so that you are not just playing language games. And let me explain that. Um, this is an insight from the famous uh, philosopher Karl Popper, uh, who talked about falsifiability. Insofar as a scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And insofar as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality, it's not real science. So falsifiability, okay, to be falsifiable is to have concrete, concrete observational consequences. Okay. Um, now falsifiability um, isn't the claim which I think we all would agree with, that scientific claims must have empirical implications if they are to be judged true or false, that you can't just float um, a scientific claim and then not have any empirical tests of it. Uh, if you want to judge that it's true or judge that it's false, you do have to do empirical studies. It's not that claim. Falsifiability is a stronger claim. It's that a scientific claims must have empirical implications if they are to make sense at all. And the claim has to make sense first before we could think about judging it true or false. And Popper argued that scientific claims must have empirical implications if they are to make sense. And that's where interdisciplinarity becomes necessary. Now, I just want to explain what more about what Popper's insight was. The alternative to making what he calls making empirical sense, talking about the real world, is producing what we philosophers call and logicians an uninterpreted calculus, where the abstract terms of science were are mere symbols. Now I know they don't feel like symbols when you're working with them, even if you're far removed from um, in concrete empirical implications, because you've got a very vivid sense of what a neuron is, um, is like. But the, the thing is that without actually connecting with concrete empirical, the concrete empirical world as we concretely experience it, um, 
these images um, are not really proper scientific images, uh, said Popper, and I would like to endorse that. So we've got terms like neuron, space-time curvature, expected utility, and all these we think of as making sense, um, but um, they, part of what Popper argued was you feel that because you know how to play the language game to move among them. What you really have to be able to do is to connect them with real empirical reality, uh, with empirical reality be before you can claim uh, that they make sense. So scientific theories and practices do provide formal ru rules for moving the symbols around. That's the uninterpreted calculus aspect. So it's like group theory in maths or first order predicate logic. There are rules for what counts as a well-formed formula and how to move among well-formed formulae. Uh, in this sense, science is an uninterpreted calculus and it stays an uninterpreted calculus unless it has concrete observable consequences. That is consequences in a language whose terms already have clear empirical interpretations. That's Popper's um, insight. Now that produces immediately the need for a host of other disciplines. So I want to just look at something which is admittedly uh, quite far uh, in the first instance from concrete empirical, um, real, concrete empirical implications, which is the general theory of relativity. But I'm perfectly happy that the, genu the general theory of relativity makes genuine meaningful claims. Why does it make? genuine meaningful claims. Why can we think that it does? That it's not just a pure mathematical theory that has some terms in it that we know how to move around and feel comfortable with, but which aren't um, genuinely connected with empirical reality. Well, one answer, one among a number of answers is the Stanford gravity probe B. I pick it because when I was at Stanford, I was a participant observer in this very long uh, 20 year experiment to put a a gyroscopes into space uh, to test the general theory of relativity. The project leader with, for this was Francis Everett. Um, and the idea, the rough idea is that um, it was predicted by Leonard Schiff that a gyroscope would precess by coupling with the space-time curvature. So seeing the precession would show that indeed there was the kind of space-time curvature that GTR uh, recommended. Um, now, how on earth does, is that? I mean, that sounds like it might be um, you no know, concrete empirical implication and GTRs you know, already at that stage, uh, uh, a meaningful, uh, according to Popper, a, me a meaningful theory. Well, um, I just want to remind you that for our discussion at this very moment, the concern isn't testing. Of course, Francis Everett was interested in testing the general theory of relativity. He had a strong sense of what it meant, but he thought he had a strong sense of what it meant. And, um, but until efforts like Everett's and his team, um, I think general theory of relativity didn't have concrete, didn't, didn't have real empirical meaning. So the concern I'm talking about here isn't testing, but um, of course, you need many disciplines to test general theory of relativity. Um, but the point is that if you believe Popper, the gravity probe team have done more than test GTR. Okay. The reason is that if you look back, Schiff's derivation is mathematical. I mean, it has to be. You start out with mathematical equations and then you derive something from them, it's going to be mathematical. So Schiff's uh, derivation is it's about, an, so the conclusion is about an object that's defined mathematically. <clears throat> that's uninterpreted calculus. Now, the work that was done over 20 years by the gravity probe team creates a concrete empirical implication of GTR. The concrete empirical implication is very, very, very complicated. Um, and it, um, it takes 20 volumes actually to describe exactly what this concrete empirical implication was. But essentially, it's something like this. If you had fused quartz spheres designed and orbited as recounted in those 20 volumes describing the gravity probe B experiment, okay, that will provide these specific readouts. That was the prediction. Um, really, now we have a 
concrete empirical prediction from GTR um, and whether or not it did what did turn out um, to uh, to be fine. Uh, three of the gyros three of the four gyroscopes worked, and um, the predictions of GTR were borne out. But the um, prior to that, the work of Everett and his team uh, provided empirical content for GTR that it might not have had otherwise. I mean, if it weren't for other teams uh, also doing the kind of work that. Um, ever was doing. Now, as I said, they weren't interested in giving it meaning. They were interested in testing it, and they never would have done all this work to give it empirical meaning um, if they weren't actually interested in testing it. But the point is that by ensuring GT, they were what they were doing. The, the philosophical point is that they were in, thereby with their work ensuring that GTR is a genuine scientific theory. It really can talk about the concrete empirical world. Now, this is not idle philosophical point. Um, there's been recently something called the credibility revolution in economics. And the point of the credibility revolution was to criticize a whole slew of economic models. And in Popper's vocabulary, the criticism was that these economic models were not falsifiable. Not, not that they were false, but that they weren't falsifiable the reason is that there were bits of them, really essential bits of them, that got filled in arbitrarily. That's exactly the kind of criticism that Popper made of Freud. Right? There's not enough content there to actually say what the empirical world is like. And so the idea here was that um, without that content, these these models are empty. They have no side, they have no genuine content. Now, perhaps it's the problem of the models and perhaps it's the problem of the other sciences, but the other sciences weren't able to provide what was needed to fill in these gaps. So the interdisciplinarity is failing here. It might be that um, the other sciences couldn't provide that kind of information because it just isn't, that kind of information doesn't exist in the world. So that's open question, but the, this is not an idle philosophic point that uh, models and, and theories are discarded um, because they don't have the empirical, no way to bring them to have empirical content. And in order to bring them to have empirical content, you need the cooperation of many disciplines. Okay, so um, interdisciplinary, I claim, is necessary to do science. You can't do real science, science about the concrete empirical world without enlisting a host of other disciplines. That's different from its interdisciplinarity is necessary to do anything with science. Um, for the first, you're enlisting others for your project as you conceive it. For the second, you need to cooperate on a joint project jointly conceived. That's the hard one, as I said. So doing something with science. Um, this is so hard because if you are using science to change the world, you have to be doing ecology. Now, ecology is literally the study of the interactions of organisms with each other and their habitat. But figuratively, it's come to be used in English to mean that it's the study of the interaction of processes with each other and their setting. So it's not confined to organisms, but any uh, compl complicated system where they're interacting processes, interacting with each other and their setting, uh, that's ecology. Okay. And these are almost always uh, multitudinous, these processes, when we're studying real world, when we really want to change the world, we're looking at uh, systems which, where the, in, the in interacting processes are multitudinous and they're highly interactive. And that's, I think, the reason, a reason that interdisciplinary is so hard is because when you're approaching um, a real system that you want to make uh, concrete changes in, um, you're, uh, you're really stuck with an ecology. So I'm gonna give a real ecology example um, a, as a start. Um, okay, so here's a science-based real ecological intervention. The Santa Cruz Island foxes were becoming extinct. Santa Cruz Island, there you see in the map, is an island um, off the coast of California between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. Okay. Now, the reason they were becoming extinct um, is that the foxes were being eaten by golden eagles. 
Now, the golden eagles were attracted by feral pigs and wild turkeys. Um, also, besides being eaten by golden eagles, um, the non-native feral sheep had eaten the shrubs where the foxes could hide from the golden eagles. Okay. Um, then the next uh, relevant factor was that DDT in the water had killed off bald eagles and bald eagles normally at the golden eagles. Okay. So <clears throat> what, what the conservationists wanted to do um, on Santa Cruz Island was introduce protected breeding sites, but the protected breeding sites weren't going to work um, unless the conservancy made efforts simultaneously to get rid of the golden eagles. And it turns out not by lethal take permits because that would have political fallout um, that uh, people don't like to see um, golden eagles being, um, uh, being killed. So they had to figure out other ways to do it. I'm gonna mention, talk about this later on, how the aims, you know, exactly what we're aiming for uh, gets modified in the course of understanding the project better. And this is one of the aims that had to be get rid of the golden eagles, but not by lethal take permits. Um, they were then to be gotten rid of by tranquilizers, fishnets, helicopter fire, net guns, etc. All of these have uh, actually considerable science behind the design of them. Um, they had to reintroduce bald eagles, eliminate wild turkeys and feral pigs and sheep. And they have to do that. They did that, for example, by teams of sharpshooters. And the sharpshoot, these teams may be stopped from their work by animal rights suits. So there are a lot of people who prefer pigs to foxes. Um, and um, they, so in order to actually get this project to work, you have the conservancy efforts had to ensure they could win these suits. There were five and all. Okay, now I'm going, as I said, I'm going to talk about evolved aims. Um, I'll just note some of them that uh, discovering that you have to ensure that you can win these suits and better have some lawyers on the team uh, was one of the evolved aims. Okay. Now, here's a tiny bit of the science that was required for this project. Quantif just to quantify the eradication success of feral pigs. I mean, they did lots and lots of things, but we wanted to see had they eradicated them. Um, they used an economic model in this paper. You see there's an economic model. Um, there's a catch effort model. Uh, they use data from GPS logs. Okay. Um, then here's another one on finding out if they have what's really happened to golden eagles and bald eagles. Um, this report um, notice uh, the science background um, that was necessary in order to do this study was they used GPS units with a Garmin base camp, right? Um, there were Acroft leg bands with alphanumeric codes and morphological measurements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's an ecological case where there's a lot of science in the background that had to be gotten to work together in order to um, uh, ensure the survival of the Santa Cruz Island foxes. Um, here's a more pure science case, mechanics in the Oxford knee. The Oxford knee, there's uh, over a million Oxford knees used worldwide. Um, it works for anterior medial osteoporosis. Um, now, um, it's a long and successful interdisciplinary cooperation. Um, it's a cooperation between a bone and joint surgeon, John Goodfellow. Um, the good fellow was looking for someone to collaborate with to investigate possible mechanical factors in the development of osteoporosis. He knew a lot about osteoporosis and he knew a lot about surgery and bones and joints, but he needed to know about um, mechanical factors. Okay, uh, so he recruited mechanical engineer John O'Connor. Now what John was studying at the time was fatigue failure, uh, such as uh, in the fuselages of aircraft. So this um, odd team got together and they worked for a very, very long period and produced and refined uh, the Oxford knee with an extended uh, interdisciplinary team. So um, how do we get interdisciplinarity to work? It worked for them. Um, it worked for Francis Everett. Um, it worked for the uh, conservation team on Santa Cruz Island. Well, I have my own two offerings. I mean, there's lots and lots of very good advice on how to get interdisciplinary to work. Um, I'm going to offer two things that I have found to be important in my career and also notice uh, that there's research on. Um, one is 
the obvious, you have to get people to talk to each other and you have to get the aims clear and do that iteratively as the project progresses. So getting people to talk to each other. Um, we, there's a problem with UK uh, child protection. Um, we, a lot of the councils, the city councils and county councils have had to sell off buildings in order to uh, make money. And that means that the social workers have been hot desking, whereas they used to all come back and sit at their desks at the end of the workday and talk to each other. And now a lot of recent research showed that the fact that um, they're hot desking and not talking to each other has made, um, uh, has led to much worse outcomes in child protection. Uh, again, getting people to talk to each other. In the World War II MIT radar project, um, at, at MIT, <laughs> there was a wonderful hierarchical system um, in the building. Uh, the, um, the mathematicians who were the most prestigious um, lived on the top floor and then the physicists and all the way down and the technicians um, lived in the basement. Okay. Uh, to get the radar designed, right, they suddenly realized this wasn't going to work. And so they took and redesigned the building and took every floor with long tables with um, the physicists, the mathematicians and the technicians all sitting there together. Uh, and um, that's thought to have been an, a, essential uh, for the success of the project. Okay. The Oxford Knee, well, um, this team worked together. They had a location at the Oxford Orthopedic Engineering Center, but also, if I'm allowed to tell tales, um, this is John O'Connor's house, where I know he and John Goodfellow and other team members uh, sat many, 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 many evenings over those 35 years. Um, and frankly, uh, also uh, met quite frequently here at the Butcher's Arms. Okay. So that's my first offering. My second offering is it's important to get the aims clear and iteratively as project progresses. Um, first example, uh, these are all very quick examples, of course, um, police and social workers thinking about child protection. Both of them have as paramount the aim of the safety of the child, but without it being having been clearly articulated at first. Um, the police also have as a side aim, uh, getting their conviction, their, their reasonable um, conviction rates up. And so they're interested in convicting um, people who are doing harm. Whereas the social work is interested in working with the families to build to their strengths. And these two different tack ons to the central aim um, was leading them in quite different directions. Um, another was um, modularizing the radar. Uh, at first, the mathematicians and the physicists were figuring out how to make a radar that would work, um, but they weren't really figuring out how to make a radar that would work concretely in the real world with real materials. And moreover, um, they weren't thinking about the needs of war. Uh, so it took a while to recognize that really wanted a modular uh, radar where you could you know, have easily removable parts uh, you could put in and out and, um, and, and fix rapidly. And that really required a certain kind of uh, uh, new whole set of technicians to be involved. Um, third is the Oxford knee. Uh, a key discover discovery for that was that the load bearing role of the natural menisci of the knee. So you first you made a discovery and then that led to an articulation of a, a more refined aim. Uh, and this is a quote from John O'Connor. If nature needs to use load bearing, nature needs to use load bearing menisci in the natural knee, then man in designing a knee replacement should do the same. Okay. Now, finally, for getting interdisciplinary to work, I suggest uh, that you might look at this um, work from the Durham. Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, Tom was part of these projects on how to navigate interdisciplinarity. So there's lots and lots of good advice there. Thank you. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, that was just a delight to hear um, and uh, to, to respond a little too with some of my own uh, um, uh, experiences, um, which uh, I thought I'd, I'd uh, use to illustrate some of the, further illustrate some of the 
wise points Nancy was making uh, there. I have a couple of examples um, for, in, 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 to, to illustrate what it perhaps feels like um, on the ground um, to be involved in projects that uh, embody um, uh, learning from nature, um, uh, uh, talking together, making aims clear. But there's something else about interdisciplinarity which I want to, 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 uh, uh, to draw out as well. Um, so let's uh, give a little bit of, a little bit of background um, to, uh, to what I wanted to, uh, to say uh, is uh, that I was involved a few years ago in the UK um, as a sort of representative from the Royal Society, our Academy of the Sciences, in a fascinating project uh, um, and publication launched by the British Academy about what was called um, crossing paths. This one could have been called knowledge across boundaries, couldn't it? It's uh, about um, interdisciplinarity as embodied in the UK higher educational system in both teaching and research. And it's a long report. I wrote one of the um, uh, chapters with, in fact, the then director of the Durham Institute of Advanced Studies, Veronica Strang, in this report. Um, uh, it, there are many questions and it's a very rich document and it's downloadable from the British Academy today. Um, I'll pop that in the, in the uh, re uh, uh, resource slide at the end. But basically it asked two, que two questions, general high level questions. One was, is interdisciplinarity a good thing by and large? Do we support it? And the answer there was absolutely yes. Everyone said basically marvelous. Yes, for all the reasons Nancy gave, you can solve real world problems. Um, you can recover a unity of knowledge, blah, blah. Then the next question people asked was, well, okay, suppose you have a, a young academic setting out in their career, one of these early career researchers. Would you encourage them to engage with interdisciplinary research? Oh no, everyone said, no, it's a terrible idea. No, no, you've got to, uh, you've got to focus on your own discipline. Well, I wonder if you can spot the inconsistency here. So we set out to see if we could resolve the inconsistency. I might leave this hanging for question time actually afterwards. So a couple of case studies to help us on our way resolve perhaps that inconsistency of, of, of all this being good for so many reasons, but being hard to achieve in practice, particularly in education. Um, so uh, one, um, I'll say was perhaps opportunity driven. It's a little bit like the Oxford knee, um, which I always thought, by the way, was a, was a painful complaint suffered by middle-aged long distance runners, but I, I, I now know much better. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and also learning from, learning from nature, in this case, on one of nature's most extraordinary natural engineering achievements, which is silk, has of course, obviously a Chinese flavor to it. So that's one reason I chose that. I'm currently working on the physics of silk. And then the second, um, driven perhaps by sheer curiosity, just, you know, interdisciplinary tourism, really, um, which is this work on medieval science that, that Stuart mentioned. And I'll just spend a very few minutes illus illustrating those, which uh, will lead us into, into discussion. So firstly, physics meets biology. Um, so you might think, well, this is not really very interdisciplinary. Not many borders have been crossed. In fact, the way that the life sciences and the physical sciences have taken different directions over the last century or more, have fascinated me. As a physicist, I had no biology in my upbringing whatsoever, not even at high school. Um, so narrow, that is how narrow <laughs> education is in the UK. I can be a professor of physics and not know anything about biology. I've had to learn a lot in my, say, middle age, push my luck on that one, about biology to understand some of the extraordinary natural in examples of the macromolecules, uh, the, the, the membranes, the self-assembled structures, and the complex flows that my physics has led me to be interested in. Um, and the formation of silk in the silkworm or in spiders here brings all those together, those ideas together. Um, silk proteins are large molecules. They're beautifully chemically or biochemically evolved. And they have an extraordinary property that when extruded from a silkworm or a, 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 a spider, transition from a sticky liquid to a semi-crystalline solid of extraordinary strength and tension. How does that happen? Well, 
um, those of us in York involved in this project, we are, we're doing some theoretical calculations. So it's a, it's a biophysical uh, example. I think it illustrates some of the things Nancy was saying about general relativity. Um, are we just writing down uninterpreted calculus on the right hand side there in the, the behind the lines of that graph? There are equations which come from mental imagined models, simplified models illustrated in this magnified view of the molecular world inside the silk worm there. We're using a model called sticky reputation. You can ask me that what that means late, later on, but it's come out of out of chemical engineering. Um, in fact, and theoretical physics of, of soft matter, um, to understand, to map, um, in this case, phenomena, which in the real world onto a falsifiable, I would claim, uh, symbolic theory, that itself might help us to learn from nature in constructing materials, uh, the fiber equivalents perhaps of the, of the Oxford knee. Um, uh, let's go to the worms, uh, the, other, the other silk producer. Apologies for any arachnophobics in the audience. Look away now. Very big spider. Um, one of the uh, the tasks that the research students in our Oxford and now Sheffield experimental collaborators lab needed to learn when they first arrived in the spider lab is to overcome fear of these animals because there was a big greenhouse in the roof with big scary spiders they needed to take the silk from. So um, interdisciplinary techniques can be, can be as emotional as they are cognitive. Uh, we've just discovered and it, we think we discovered theoretically an extraordinary phenomenon. Now a lot of this, this science is driven from observation. But one thing I've learned is that there's a, a gorgeous interplay between observations of the natural world and observations of the theoretical world that can surprise us and delight us just as much as the, as the uh, experimental ones can. And by creating a computer model of what is going on as the silk is extruded and pulled out into a fiber and looking at what happens to particular long chain protein molecules here. Um, my colleague uh, 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 Charlie Schaefer and I have discovered a very strange thing. Now this is just a, a distribution of stretch. Um, lambda is the stretch. This is the distribution from stretch. I'm increasing the flow rate here and you can see on these log log axes at a glance I'm sure that there's a very very high tail of very very stretched molecules. Up here is the time dependent graph. You can see some of the polymers being stretched hugely. Now we've no idea whether this answers the question but for the first time it might answer the question how has nature evolved the biochemistry of this extraordinary material silk to respond so critically but so efficiently to stretch so that suddenly semi-crystalline polymers are formed. It's as if it only needed to stretch a tiny fraction of the molecules in there. Well, how could it do that? We seem to have found a candidate phenomenon. But this has involved talking, conversations between biologists, biochemists, engineers, theoretical physicists, rheologists, um, around an object, namely silk itself, which has acted as a sort of focal point for our language, for our methodologies, um, and to learn from each other. Let's moving, move rapidly on to my second example. So boundary crossing for the first was, was a clear opportunity. This is just interest. And it's a Durham story. When I arrived in Durham as Vice President for Research back in 2008, um, I was one thing I was quite keen to do as a scientist. I'm very, very well aware in these positions that the humanities scholars would have been thinking, oh my goodness, another scientist um, uh, is not going to understand how the humanities work. And I'm not sure I still do. Uh, I couldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't claim that, but I know a little bit more now than I did. I love the way the humanities work. Um, but in one way, I've always been fascinated by the history as well as the philosophy of my own subject. And I was delighted to discover uh, a world leading center of medieval study was in uh, uh, Durham at that point, um, who were looking at well, beautiful, beautiful manuscripts like this. And I'd always been a little suspicious of the story, the textbook story I was told about the history of science that really before the 17th century in Europe, Galileo, Newton, Boyle and all this, there was nothing that one could call science. And here were documents written a good three to 400 years earlier on light, color, 
sound on the cosmos. This is one about um, uh, the uh, the spheres. Um, uh, they're uh, the ones we were looking at and have looked at since um, were, were written in the main by an extraordinary polymath himself, an interdisciplinarian all in one, Robert Grosstest, um, uh, in the 1200s. Uh, there he is in a illustration, later illustration, he became Bishop of Lincoln uh, later on. But before he did that, he wrote about mathematics and, and, and science. Um, little um, biography came from, from a rather um, poor uh, uh, east of England backgrounds. He learned from the Franciscans and actually uh, taught to that uh, early community in, in Oxford um, and uh, uh, had missions to the Pope. So he was a, a politician, he was a statesman, he was a pastor, a theologian um, himself, as well as a scientist. Now, you may think, well, how could you call a person like this a scientist? Well, I've read some of the stuff and I still remember the moment where Thanks to this interdisciplinary environment in Durham, then in which I was placed, I had the opportunity as a physicist, a theoretical physicist in the first decade of the 21st century, reading a treatise, a mathematical treatise on light written in about 1224. Well, I say reading, it's in Latin. So I, although I do have a little bit of Latin from my school days, not quite enough to read this fluently. I'm sure you will do, which is why I've led, this is after all a very high level seminar. So while you're translating to Latin to yourself there, I can explain why, of course, I found this extremely interesting. That this is someone not talking in a mystical, metaphorical, theological way about light. He's talking about a problem to do with the mystery of the solidity of the material world. And one thing I have to say I love about science, I'm very proud about science, is, is that uh, it, it provides us the several tools to distinguish between being familiar with something and really understanding it. You know, we're familiar with rainbows and we see them all the time or ripples on this, on windblown ripples on the lakes, but do you do understand? And one of the wonderful things about the human mind is, is its evolved capacity to understand the deep structure of the world behind the surface of phenomena. And here's Gosta saying, hmm, you shouldn't take it for granted that you should just sit on those chairs, you know, because if we take atoms and the idea of atoms uh, at face value, they're just some sort of dust, like these two galaxies from this beautiful Hubble telescope photograph. They can't, they're not really solid, they look solid, but they're not, they bounce off each other. They won't bounce off each other, they'll pass through each other. So this 13th century document, I realised, was not principally about light, it's about the stability of matter. Uh, and so, I, we realised in the discussion between humanities scholars and scientists at this point that the, the scientists' current formation allows a perspectival view of these ancient texts that is additional, it's complementary to that of the textual, philological, historical, theological formation of the humanities scholars. Uh, there's more uh, to this. There's... Um, Agrostes does an ex makes an extraordinary intellectual move that we normally only associate with Newton. Um, it's also theologically motivated, by the way, which is, interests me fascinatingly. There's always been a, a, a deep and interesting and very constructive and enga imaginative engagement between theology and belief and science throughout the, the ages. This is true of the early modern period as, 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 any, other, uh, as any other period. Um, and incidentally, when, when reading uh, about the wisdom from this century and how it was picked up in the early modern century, one realizes that far deeper than the very superficial warfare or conflict between science and religion that people prattle about these days, uh, an, an, an informed insight into what's gone on before um, takes you, leads you to a very different view. So here's Gross test taking on Aristotle, as these Christians did, but wanting to modify um, them in the light of their own belief. And what the way Grosstest realised he has to modify Aristotle is to think of a physics for a temporal origin to the world. Aristotle didn't have a temporal origin to the world. So he makes this extraordinary leap. He takes this theory he has of light providing matter or something like, like light providing matter with its solidity in a tabletop or a chair <laughs> and projects it out into the cosmos as a whole. Um, there we have his quote, light at the beginning of the time extended matter, it drawing it out into uh, a sphere 
the size of the world machine. It's a sort of medieval Big Bang theory. Now, of course, it's not our current cosmos at all. And one big lesson that we make sure we learn and implement all the time in this project is not to project back our 21st century standards of truth or acquired knowledge back in an evaluatory sense on these early thinkers, but it is an extraordinary um, uh, step nonetheless. We, this interdisciplinary world allows to explore and extend existing methodologies. You see, although Grosdes didn't have algebra or differential calculus like that in uh, the 13th century, nor for that matter, did he have English, but he is able to write down highly mathematical statements, there they are, there they are in the Latin, and we thought to ourselves, well look, if we're prepared to translate those Latin statements into English together with all the complexities that and richnesses of perspective that translation provides into another language, why don't we translate them into another language that we have now that we didn't have before, which is the language of mathematics. Now again, it's not to project back, it's more to project on, um, but it allowed us other ways of manipulating the ideas in the in the text. So um, to, to draw to, to an end, it's just given this little taster of the sort of richness in this curiosity driven interdisciplinary boundary crossing tourism. Um, it, it's been hugely surprising. So to meet scientists, meet with paleographers, Latinists, historians, we have done what we imagined we would be able to do, which is to together write better um, commentaries, uh, uh, explanations of the text. Here are two examples. There's a series by OU Oxford University Press on Robert Cross Test of Science. We've just published volume one. We have five more to go. So in a sense, you could say, yes, the scientists have helped the humanities scholars with this, but more has happened. The last thing we expected was that we would be stimulated, the scientists, to produce and think through new science today. But that has happened as well. Not just once, I explained one, this is the paper that, from the Royal Society that came out of that, the mathematical and computational modeling of Gross Test's Big Bang Theory. New mathematics came out of that, new algorithms. 10 times this has happened now. So the no other thing I wanted to say was that, was that interdisciplinary work, uh, although it can be engaged initially towards a particular goal, all, almost always provides vision of intellectual and practical pathways to explore that weren't even perceived when uh, the teams set out together. So here are my disciplinary lessons. I'm afraid I have just a few more. I'm embarrassed. Nancy had two wonderful ones, but I think these, these match what she was saying. Um, disciplines are because they are our current artificial boundaries. They must be complementary when it comes to truth claims. They mutually valorize themselves. That's important. And I think um, Nancy's first point that whenever we do anything, we rely implicitly on other disciplines is very precious here. Helps us to be humble too. Um, in terms of practicality, yes, picking up on Nancy's, but I would, I put time in capital letters there because spending time together, uh, learning about each other's language and words and ideas, um, co-reading, thinking about the same object is very important. The last thing to say is that trespassers should be uh, 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 not be prosecuted. Um, we're, we're allowed to, to um, make little essays, little, little trials as students in each other's domains, but we don't dominate them. Here's an important lesson, especially for professors. Mm, uh, there are no stupid questions. But hey, I love Nancy's MIT lesson. Interdisciplinarity is the best academic leveler I know. You can't be a, have professorial hierarchies in interdisciplinary work because look, around the table, there are six to 10 disciplines. I'm only professor in one. I'm, a, I'm an undergraduate student in all the others. And one of the most beautiful things that I heard at those IAS, Institute of Advanced Studies workshops, I'm a graduate student who said, it's interesting, I can speak up and ask questions and contribute in interdisciplinary seminars, though I've never had the courage to do so in my own departmental seminars. Now, why is that? Well, it's because we're all students together here. We're all mutually learning and teaching each other. And there's, I think, an academic value, which I've learned to call academic hospitality, which has come out of this. But I'm very excited, as Stuart pointed out at the beginning now, in, in these distant inter 
interdisciplinary ventures of science and humanities. And I think that we're learning again, not to put science, I hope, in a little technical box, but to realize it just as much as art, storytelling, narrative poetry, it too is part of a culture we must learn to share within the humanities. Uh, leadership, the sort of sharing, encouraging and vulnerable leadership is uh, vital in all of this. And I've said before, these contexts can be very affirming for early career researchers. So far from that second question being no, I would underline a yes. Early career researchers, this is where you find a level playing field and you can be more imaginative even in your own discipline if you engage in interesting ways in, in others. Here are some resources. Um, I expect we'll be able to leave those on the website afterwards. And from uh, that point, I'd like to thank Junji very much for inviting me and uh, we'll move on to the discussion. Wow, incredible. Thanks very much, Nancy and Tom, for the most enlightening presentation. A number of questions have been posted by the audience and we will try to cover as many as possible. Nancy, our first question concerns the practicing of interdisciplinary research. Can you suggest tricks to open up research questions enough so as to allow other disciplines to contribute? Uh, yes, I think I can suggest a couple. In my own um, work recently, um, you know, I've been working on social policy and in the UK, US, um, and fairly widely across the Anglophone world and Europe, um, there, uh, there's been the creation of this what works movement, uh, which is the idea of trying to bring science to these practical problems about social policy and how to improve social policy. Now that's the story, but the thing is what they're trying to do is bring science social science and natural science results uh, to um, the practice rather than you know, the current buzzword is co-producing, but rather than co-producing the kind of knowledge that's necessary with the practitioners. So we have a, a kind of here, you know, <laughs> um, we've tried to adjust this so it looks like the kind of thing you need so there's a lot of studies of what policies work, um, but they're not, they're not actually studies that um, have been evolved with the practitioners who, so a way to open up the research questions for getting interdisciplinary work on them is I think uh, to do this business of looking at what the interdisciplinary research is supposed to be for. Um, you know, I, I mean, I just really am hung up a bit on this business of, <laughs> of getting the aims clear, because as soon as you get the aims clear, um, you begin to realize that you don't actually have the science exactly right that's supposed to help with that, those aims. You realize that you have to involve lots of other sciences um, and lots of other disciplinary knowledge and lots of local knowledge. So um, I still think that it's key if you want to open up research questions uh, for interdisciplinarity, uh, at least when the idea is that this interdisciplinary work is going to be of use to changing the world, that uh, you've got to really get down the brass tacks about what actually you're going to be doing with this and also talking together. Thanks very much, Nancy. Tom, would you have anything to suggest? Yeah, um, is I I'd absolutely absolutely right. I wanted to um, just re-emphasize that the the instrumental changing the world types of interdisciplinary work are of course vital and very important uh, that Nancy has referred to, um, but that uh, and in those the aims need to be very very clear. Mm, but I, I think I'd I'd want to say uh, it, it's because people use different languages, and our ideas and even our approach to what constitutes a solved problem can be different. That's true, by the way, even of the biological sciences and the life sciences. One of the problems physicists and molecular biologists have in talking with each other is that, is that we've evolved in uh, to construe what, could, what amounts to an answer to a scientific question in different ways sometimes. So it's possible when defining the aims to think that we've established them and we still yeah. haven't done sufficient interdisciplinary communication. Um, 
that's one thing I'd say. The second thing, so therefore that implies this huge amount of time and learning um, to share our aims and make sure we've got our vocabulary right. The second thing is not to be overweeningly um, ambitious in what we do. Well, be ambitious, but be humble at the same time. So recently there's been a project that's illustrated all the things that can go wrong. It's a European project um, yeah. called the, the Human Brain Initiative or the Brain Project. And there was... Um, uh, a vast over amount of hubris in terms of modeling the entire rat brain on a computer and things, it was never gonna work. Um, but had it been clearer about its real, the potential real possible aims at the beginning, it would have been much happier. <laughs> a couple of things. Thanks very much, Tom, thank you. Tom, you made a remark regarding ECR and IDR. We have a related question here for you. Can postgraduates and early career researchers situated in fairly traditional departments effectively incorporate interdisciplinary methods and perspectives? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, they can, and they and they will be hugely advantage to do so. But of course, it's something that's very difficult for them to do on their own. Um, now, at York, actually, I have to say. Um, over the long vacations in the summers, the postgraduates across the faculties got together and gave themselves their own interdisciplinary seminars. Hooray for them. These are research students and a few postdocs. Um, never mind the staff. They, don't, they didn't care whether we set up structures like this to help them or not. So good for them. So I was, I was about to say it needs the university to help them. It turns out all it needs the university to do, to do is, is, to, is to support their own initiatives sometimes. However, um, that only goes so far. And I do think it behoves uh, universities and those of us in positions of, of uh, management and leadership in, in universities to provide the, the, the right fora that will um, encourage early career researchers into those prosperous environments, um, prosperous for ideas, I mean, that don't, detra that, that, that don't as it were, um, you know, detract from their primary yeah. research, but, but use the interdisciplinarity connectivity to, connectivity to feed into it and enrich it. Thanks, so for example, That's I'd say the uh, EPSRC Centres for Doctoral Training um, and other Centres for Doctoral Training are doing this very well. Brilliant. Thank you. Nancy and Tom, I will put this question in two ways. Firstly, to modify an English saying, is it better to be a jack of all trades or a master of one? The original question posted was, having deep specialised knowledge in a subject, or knowing a bit of all subjects, which of these would enable us more to contribute valuable inputs when working in an interdisciplinary research team? I'm glad to say it's Nancy's turn to answer a question. <laughs> okay, um, I think you need teams uh, with uh, both kinds of people and you mustn't lose the deep disciplinary knowledge uh, when you move uh, when, when you're doing an interdisciplinary team because it's the, I mean, it's the real science that's back there that's contributing. Uh, the question is how to get it to contribute along with others, you know, deep uh, knowledge. And sometimes then it helps to have on that team people who have a, a bit of knowledge of the different disciplines. Um, but if you, if you just had either people who were jack of all trades, you wouldn't have, uh, I mean, the serious science that's actually going to help you. Um, I mean, we've done all this work to do this serious science. Um, you, I mean, you can't um, test the general theory of relativity without having people who know, you know a ton about bits of physics, bits of materials, engineering, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, you, if, if you just stuck them um, in a room together, um, unless a lot of the right kind of background settings going on, um, you'd be better off if you also had some people who knew um, a little bit uh, uh, about everything. Now you can overcome the, um, the need for jacks of all trades. Um, and I think that's partly what happened in the radar project by the thing that Tom and I have both stressed, you know, just extended time talking and working together. That's how the aims get refined. And I realize that my aim doesn't quite match your aim. And there's not a translation procedure here. It's a matter of getting some settling on some aims together. Um, the historian of science, Peter Gallison, uh, says that 
um, maybe what you should realize is stop trying to translate between um, different disciplines when you're doing an interdisciplinary project, but you learn to speak a pigeon together. Um, you, uh, you speak something which isn't kind of proper anything, but the point of it being a pigeon is that the, there are the native languages behind it that have the resources uh, to you know, actually get on and solve the problems. Anyway, so I guess I've just got a mix of, uh, you. <laughs> best thing is to have a mix and to have lots of time to work together and getting something accomplished interdisciplinarily um, is just as difficult or more difficult than doing it within the discipline and you can't do it without investing. Yeah, I wanted to say something to this question, because I think the, the question actually, of course, like many questions, is it A or B, you know, um, okay. assumes um, that we all agree the premises of the question. I'm not sure I entirely do. Um, in other words, I don't think it's binary like this. Um, and Nancy has torn down one way of it being non-binary. Um, I'd like to look at another way of it being non-binary. Um, which is about um, individuals within, within a team and what one can aspire to do. Uh, now, I, so I, I do, <laughs> until recently, I thought I'd invented the idea of the T-shaped person. Um, so let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, uh, an an I-shaped person is someone who is just very narrow and deep, uh, that or a silo. Nancy showed us the lovely pictures of silos, right? A T-shaped per uh, person um, is, um, is someone who has that depth but also has their arms outside, you know, has a valency, has the community knows enough about other subjects, their languages, their methodologies to establish an under, a, 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 a healthy channel of communication among the team. So actually, in, I, I prefer to say that it's better if you can do this for every member in an interdisciplinary team to be T-shaped. Uh, in the sense that they they do not relinquish their deep knowledge of their own fields. In other words, that's what they bring to the party. But they've also read, engaged, even written, co-written. They've involved themselves in other subjects, not, of course, to the level that they can. You know, so I'm never going to be, you know, a, me a full-blown medieval scholar. But have I brushed up my Latin? You bet I have. Was that costly in time? You bet it was. Is it rewarding in the in the terms of the medieval science project? Absolutely rewarding, um, because I can appreciate more. It's not that I can do the translations that my my uh, medieval uh, uh, historian colleagues do, but I know the issues they're facing and can better help them when it comes to feeding in some of the physics and mathematics, you see. So that's what I mean by being t-shirt. Now, I didn't invent it. Carl Gombrich, um, Professor Carl Gombrich, who's, um, the, I know he's with us this morning. Uh, he's in the, the uh, participant and he's also tweeting. So if you don't follow Carl, then you should do. He's um, uh, introduced me to a, a, a book on interdisciplinarity. Uh, he can tell us about it, uh, which has even charts and diagrams about being T-shaped. So. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Tom, I know from personal experience that you have successfully led large interdisciplinary teams. One of our attendees asks, I'm very interested in the relationship between interdisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary individuals. What are the characteristics of the researchers who succeed at these sort of endeavors? The answer to that is to be T-shaped. Um, so one, one, one spends time both with the individuals of other disciplines and, and with their educational material so as to understand and appreciate how those other disciplines do, primarily to build together the sort of, you know, at the beginning of a sports game, you know, what does a team do? It all gets into this sort of team huddle. Well, it, it's the academic equivalent of that communicative huddle that one it behoves each individual to participate in. It, it is important to note that not everybody can be a T-shaped person. Ah, so we have a question here. So if, if people who can't be T-shaped, can they be welcomed into interdisciplinary teams? Can they play a part in disciplinary teams? I think they can, but one has, what would you replace, Nancy? How would you, how would you use a very non-T-shaped person within an interdisciplinary team that, but that in a way that would avoid the obvious disconnects and potential damage? Well, I think it's very difficult um, to, um, for people who aren't T-shaped, I, I like that concept. One of the things I'm always advising is if you're doing an inter, want to really do an interdisciplinary project, you have to pick not only the right 
disciplines to contribute, which you don't know at first, so you have to keep changing. You have to pick the right people, people with the right abilities, not in their own discipline, but to be what you now call, uh, what you've been calling T-shaped, um, and also the right personality and willingness. Um, and if you've got a team of people who are incapable, really, of thinking um, in a different way, who think that, the, I mean, we all understand our own methods and our own, and why some methods are good and not others. Um, you know, we have our standards for what um, a good work um, uh, amounts to. And if you can't let go of those standards and those methods, you know, you just have to stick to, um, you, you really can't see how what's going on over here is proper science or, you know, a proper way to discover something. I mean, the way that people, um, well, I guess um, there, there are now some people who are so dedicated to the only way you can learn about causality is by randomized controlled trials, that they, they can't work with other people who are concerned with other notions of causality and other ways of finding out. So, sorry, that was a long mm -hmm. <laughs> getting into that. I think it's really difficult if you've got, if you're trying to put together a team um, and the people on it are either constitutionally or personality wise or just way of thinking wise, unable mm -hmm. to let go of their own ways of modeling uh, their own ways, uh, their own methods, and their own what, standards. I mean, it's not that they want you want to have no standards, but that you have to recognize that other people in other disciplines. Oh, when I was at Stanford, uh, some you know sometimes scientists don't like to talk to philosophers, and when I was uh, talking to one of the leading experimental physicists there, he essentially said, "My colleagues wouldn't talk to you, but I will because I reckon if you've got to be hired by Stanford University in this top philosophy department, you must <laughs> you must have <laughs> something going for you." Uh, but it, that was the idea that uh, I, you know he was um, perhaps for the wrong reason, but he was willing to take on board that philosophy might actually somebody who was right. doing philosophy might have standards and might have something to offer, and that it was really up to. Uh, a standard. Uh, anyway, sorry, that's a long yeah. uh, discussion. I, perhaps I should say, let me just say one more thing. Let us move on from using the word depth purely to describe those with deep single discipline yes. understanding. Yes. Yeah. So let me say it for Nancy. Nancy has just up a slide, believe me, she gets those Einstein equations for general relativity. She spent years studying them. Now, are you going to really accuse someone who can do GR at that level and understands Popper and the social discourse and the logic of scientific discovery and, 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 and the social practice and use of metaphor within science a shallow? I think not. There is a deep depth to be found in understanding both interdisciplinarity and how different disciplinary knowledge is linked together, a huge depth. And it's personally a depth I desperately aspire to and hugely admire in people like Nancy. Thanks very much, Tom and Nancy. It's a pity that um, it's a time to bring the Q&A to an end because of the time duration. And in so doing, I wish to reiterate our deep gratitude to Nancy and Tom. It's been a true privilege. I'm going to give the last word to Durham University's Pro Vice Chancellor Global, Professor Claire O'Malley. Claire. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Nancy and Tom, for that fascinating session, which I'm sure has given us a, a great deal to think about. Um, I think it's really appropriate that we've heard about the value of interdisciplinary research as part of this webinar series, because it's all about working together, uh, not just across disciplines, but also across geographical borders. Um, we're absolutely delighted that our researchers have been working with colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, over a number of years, as well as uh, with academics across the globe. We're very excited to deepen and expand our collaborations going forward. Uh, and, and that's uh, one of the reasons for having this, uh, this uh, webinar series. I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today, uh, including Consul General Zheng. I'm very pleased to say that we've got further talks planned in the new year, and uh, you can keep up to date with the series via our website. 
uh, we'll have the link on the closing slide in a minute. We'll also send you all uh, the recording of today's lecture, which you're very welcome to share with colleagues. We'd be delighted if you could join us again. But for now, I'd like to bring this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you again to Nancy and Tom. Thank you to Junji for your excellent sharing. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, we hope to see you next time. Um, have a great holiday, everybody, um, and look forward to seeing you in the new year.